Hey, this is Raul for Bass Musician Magazine, and we are at the 2016 Winter NAMM Show in uh, Anaheim, California. I have the great pleasure of having Joe Zahn with me. Um, those of you that are in the know of basses have more likely than not heard uh, some of Joe's masterpiece instruments in the hands of amazing musicians. The one that always comes to my mind, of course, Michael Mannering. Yep. He's, uh, you know, just, he blows me away every time he plays. And one of the reasons we wanted to get together with Joe is because at Bass Musician Magazine, we have declared 2016 the year of the luthier. And we believe that the luthier is an important part of our craft and our art, because without luthiers, uh, we would be trying to make our own instruments, you know, with a big wire and a, a block and trying to stretch it out and, and, and do that. So part of what I'd like to know is, John, I mean, John, Joe, long day, been okay. on the floor all day long. No problem. What made you want to build bases? <sighs> well, I wanted to uh, build instruments for myself. I started off building instruments for myself. Um, I really didn't have any aspirations to building bases for a living. Um, I mean, I, I was just, there were things about the instruments that I had that were substandard. Um, I started off playing uh, a, uh, a beetle bass copy. And I was always good with my hands, and I did all sorts of bike repairs and crazy stuff like that. And as the, uh, the beetle bass was starting to rattle apart, I started you know, putting it back together. I mean, I just didn't know any better. It was just sort of natural for me to do that. And uh, so I kind of enjoyed doing that. And uh, hardly as it seems, I one day I just woke up and thought, you know, I want to build my own instrument. You know, I was one of those guys that hung out in music stores looking at all sorts of stuff. And mm -hmm. it's like, wow, this is cool. And this body style and so forth. And uh, pickups and so on. And um, uh, I just decided that, you know, it'd be a cool thing if I could make my own bass, and I'd have something the way that I wanted it. Gotcha. And um, my dad had a really good friend that worked at a uh, lumber mill, mm -hmm. and uh, they were doing custom furniture and things like that, and so I sketched up this design, and John Anton was, was always a huge influence on me, mm -hmm. and his Fender Bird was something that really, I was like, wow, that was, that was cool. So, um, one of my I had built a couple of things, and the one that really was successful for me was this, this Fender Bird that I built. And so uh, uh, his, his buddy took a piece of oak and cut out the body shape for me, and uh, took a piece of birch and made the, you know, cut out the neck shape for me. And I spent a good part of the summer with a surf arm and, and 80 grit sandpaper, machining it out, and chiseling the pickup cavities and all this kind of thing. And, you know, this goes back to a time when there were no books on building basses or guitars or anything. It was only violins. There wasn't a YouTube video on how do you build your own bass. Uh, no, YouTube was, in, was, was not, uh, yeah, exactly. And uh, to, in, to that point, I mean, the only people that were supplying any sorts of parts that you could possibly get, like tuning keys and such, were Carmen, because that's where they started. So I'm dating myself, but that's where I begin. Those are my, my beginnings. Which has been how many years now that you've been building? Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> our, our official production instruments started coming out in 82. There you go. But uh, we, that evolved from a custom guitar shop. There's a, there's a big gap between what I just told you about and this custom guitar shop gotcha. thing. But um, yeah, I mean, officially, it's 87. I mean, we, we did, we, our first name show was 82. We did a bunch of those off and on. Mm -hmm. And uh, back in 82, 83, um, I decided that I wanted to build my own instruments, something that was gonna be roadworthy, something that was gonna really um, enhance the player's ability to perform and record. And I've got experience with graphite composites and stuff from college. And uh, I was in the repair business. I had, a, I had a successful repair shop in Buffalo, New York. And we just had guys coming in all the time saying, well, this is, this is a problem, that's a problem. We had REM coming in and uh, bringing bases to us. And of course, Rick James uh, 
his guys would bring stuff in and we just it was always a problem there was you know screw stripping out and things so I took in my I, I, I reflect back back to my repair experience and, and kind of took mental notes as to what was good about certain things and what was bad about certain things gotcha and you know one of the things was you know wood screws in all their bodies for P-Base and J-Base pickups that would continually strip out. Mm -hmm. You know, you had to redial, uh, re redial those. And, you know, that really was something that I took note of. And as a result, we used threaded inserts on all of our instruments for the pickup adjustment screws because I don't want those wood screws Stripping to strip out, out you know? Uh, just all sorts of things. But I, t I took my knowledge of composites and my uh, experience in building and repairing instruments and designed my own instruments. And uh, I primarily started doing it just for myself because that's, I was building something for myself, something that I wanted, something I thought was going to be you know, really valuable. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I, I did a lot of repair work for the, for the Rick James Band and those guys came on and said, well, Rick should try this. And Rick was one of our first endorsees and really dug the bases. And one thing led to another, and uh, we ended up getting John Wetton on board from uh, Asia at the time, and the psychedelic furs, and everything just kind of evolved from there. So it was my experience at the 82 show in Chicago was particularly exciting because that was my first NAMM show with these instruments that I had designed and built. And the folks from Olympic sent their spies over. Nice. And, uh, you know, they were kind of scrutinizing the instruments. And then um, it was amazing to have uh, Susan and Ron Wickersham come over and look at the instruments and, and really compliment us, compliment me on uh, what, we di what I did. And, and um, because I had admired their work for so many years. Gotcha. And they were definitely an influence on me, even much more so than Fender. And uh, so for them to, you know, to tip their hat was just, just a huge uh, an honor to me. And so that, I got, I got the bite. I got bit, you know, I'm, I was in. And you were hooked. <laughs> I was hooked, yeah. From there on yeah, out. Yeah. Um, with a specific thing, and something we've been seeing a lot more of, especially like on a show like this, it comes to the material with which you are working. Uh, when we were in Italy, we were looking at marble uh, pieces that Michelangelo was working on and he could see the statue inside of the rough stone. And, and sure. so, with wood, do you, do you look at a piece of wood and you're kind of going, oh, I, I see the base in that? Or you, I, I know that some people go, well, you know, it's as simple as like mahogany for a thunderbird or a heavier wood, you know, for this. Um, how are you selecting? What is what is kind of the process? Or do you, do you well, actually? I, I got to start by saying that uh, my real Christmas is when Mark and I get a batch of wood and we start resawing the wood for tops. Gotcha. Because that is like you don't know what you're getting. It's like opening a Christmas gift, mm -hmm. and so and most of the time, 99% of the time, it's like wow, and uh, so that one of the most fun aspects of working with wood. Now, um, you know, over the years, I know what woods sound like. Mm -hmm. um, I've experimented enough, tried different combinations and so forth. Um, in fact, I was one of, the, one of the first, if not the very first guys, to use Bubinga for a tone wood. Uh, because I knew the tonal characteristics of Bubinga mm -hmm. and uh, I knew that it was going to give that focus and cut that players needed and so uh, you know we incorporated that into the Sony Special specifically with that wood mm -hmm. using that wood so that it would give that that voice to that instrument gotcha. so um, yeah I mean the, the, the after you work with woods for a certain amount of time you realize how they they play into the voice of the instrument uh, you know what they reinforce what they enhance what they take away what mm -hmm. you know what they diminish um, so from that I, I'm able to you know dial in the instrument to the players needs and give them the sonic thumbprint they want gotcha and for a starting musician because I know that 
many start at a kind of an entry level, which I find if you don't start with at least a decent instrument, it can just be so terribly frustrating because yeah. it doesn't do, it doesn't reward you when you're playing. Right. And so right. What, what recommendation, what advice would you have for somebody who's kind of getting started uh, as, as far as what they would be looking for in, in a bass? Buy the bass, excuse me, buy the best bass you can afford. Gotcha. You know, the thing is that years ago I was in retail and parents would come in with their kid and say, well, I don't want to spend a lot of money and so I want to get something that's inexpensive and, you know, to see if they like it or not. And <laughs> they, they might quit. And yeah, they might quit. And they yeah. would walk out with a classical guitar. I was like, no, 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 no. First off, the neck is too wide for the small hands. Secondly, the nylon strings keep stretching. It's going to be frustrating. It doesn't, you're going the wrong, yeah, okay, it's 50 bucks, but if you spend $100 and get them a steel string, they're going to get more gratification out of it. Sure. And the same thing holds true for bass. And uh, I would definitely say buy the, 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 the best bass you can afford. If, if you've got $300, spend the $300, don't buy a $200 bass. If you've got $1,000, spend $1,000 or whatever. Because the thing is that not only will you get the resale value back from the instrument if you decide that you don't play anymore, but it's the, the better quality of the instrument, the more gratification you're going to get, the faster you're going to progress in, in your learning process. Gotcha. So it's important to get a good instrument. There's, there's no... No don't, shortcut. Yeah, don't don't shortchange yourself by getting a cheap, cheap junkie instrument. I gotcha. Yeah. Well, do you have any parting thoughts as, as we progress? Well, only in January with this year of the luthier. <laughs> any, any thoughts for, for perspective players, perspective luthiers? Uh, anything else you want to mention? You know, that's an interesting question. Um, I think the uh, the industry is in a difficult time right now, and I'm a little sad by that because uh, I think that with the budget cuts to the schools and the lack of places to play, and um, you know, concert tickets being 400 bucks a pop and all this, I think it's a it's a trying time for musicians, for the industry, and and for the audience as well. I mean. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm hoping that things will, will change a bit, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it's, it's so important for people to learn how to play music, whether they're going to become professional or not, it doesn't really matter. It's just learning to have the appreciation and love for music um, is so vitally important to our society, to our history. Um, you know, I, we got to keep it alive. Absolutely. And uh, whether that's guitar or banjo or horn or whatever bass, it, it doesn't really matter. What's important is that you're involved in music to some greater or lesser degree. Whether you want to be a professional or not, having an understanding and appreciation of it is just the most wonderful thing that uh, we have to offer. You know, uh, I've told my boys that there's one language. I have two 11-year-old twins, boys, mm -hmm. who are both playing instruments. And I've told them two things about music. One is that music will always be your friend, no matter what happens. No matter you have your worst days or your best days, you're alone and, 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 you know, depressed. Music is always there for you. It's always your friend. Secondly, music is the language that is spoken all over the world. Totally. No, you can, you can go anywhere in the world, and if you know the native language or not, it doesn't matter. If you know music, they know you. They Absolutely. you can you can communicate. So that's the that's the beauty of it all. Fabulous. Well, Joe, thank you so much for taking well, time. My pleasure. Out of your busy schedule, talking to our readership, we are so grateful as musicians to those that build the instruments. Oh, I thank you. That give life to the music that we can create. So oh, uh, it's a great honor to have you as part of the Year of the Luthier ah. 2016. You saw it here at BassMusicianMagazine.com.